Mina, Konbanwa, Jesus Freaking Gamer here. Konbanwa because it's dark outside, but it still is Monday morning, like I said it would be. So let's just hop into this. Going to be wrapping up Psalm 18 slash 2 Samuel chapter 22. I'm just really loving all the stuff that I'm personally getting out of this, and I think, uh, I think some really good stuff has been kind of dug out of these scriptures the last three weeks. So I might... No guarantees here, but I might just finish up today. Not a ton left. So let's just hop right into 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse 38. And here we go. I have pursued my enemies and destroyed them. Neither did I turn back again till they were destroyed. And I have destroyed them and wounded them so that they could not rise. They have fallen under my feet. And that kind of bounces off of the promises in the previous messages that I've talked about where God is our rock and our defender. He is also um, the one who goes out before us. He rebukes our enemies and his enemies for his sake. He gives our hands and our fingers strength to fight so that our arms can bend a bow of bronze back in verse 35. So this is essentially the outcome of that. When the Lord equips you and your enemies are the Lord's enemies, and you and him both go out together to fight whatever that enemy is, victory is pretty much guaranteed. And I've said, as I've said before, it bears repeating pretty much over and over again, whereas in the Old Testament, a lot of the battles were fought just straight out in the physical. They were wars. They were battles. People died. Most of our battles as Christians nowadays are in the spiritual realm, in the mental and emotional realm. I didn't, I'm not exclusively saying no physical because... As an American citizen, I'm a fan of the military. I appreciate what they do for this country. And I think physical protection, even on the home front, like self-defense, has its place. And I think the Lord can absolutely help our military here in the United States. He can help military in other nations. He can help individuals protect the, their own lives and the lives of their families. So I'm not completely excluding physical intervention. But that is more on the down low. In, nowadays in the New Covenant. Um, when we go out to fight, we're not trying to go out and conquer nations in the name of Jesus by holding up a gun to their head and saying, you know, believe in Jesus or we're going to shoot you. That's not how it works. Even if they said, yeah, I believe in Jesus, it wouldn't be a real conversion. They'd be simply trying to save their life because the crazy person pointed a gun at their head. Our battles come in the form of prayer. Our battles come in the form of praise and worship. Our battles come in the form of preaching. And our battles come in the form of fighting against things that are wrong in our lives, in our friends' lives, and in the culture we live in, all of those people's lives. Those are where our battles come in. I believe that this promise that David inherited as a king, he did battling not only physically, I have no doubt he did a lot of battle spiritually. You read a lot of the Psalms and the things that he wrote and sung, and a lot of the Psalms that were done around the tabernacle during David's time, it wasn't just physical fighting. I'm not sure what the ratio was back then as opposed to now. I know physical is much on the lower end nowadays. But regardless of the percentage-wise, back in the Old Testament time and in David's time, there was definitely some spiritual battling going on. I would reference you to the book of Psalms in its entirety. That's a lot of reading. It's a lot of good reading. I, and I said this before. In one of my previous messages, I believe there's a big reason that the biggest book in the Bible is a book of songs, psalms, praise, and worship. That should speak pretty heavily on the emphasis that God wants that to have in our lives. Because the biggest book in his Bible, in his word, it's all songs, praise, and worship. Really good stuff. And so the Lord equips us to fight. And when he equips us to fight... We have weapons that will tear down the works of the enemy. We have weapons that will destroy the power of sin in our lives and in the, in the power of sin in other people's lives. We have victory in Jesus' name. Referencing the New Testament, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us and gave himself for us. It should be in the book of Romans somewhere. Google's your friend, as always. And then on to verse 40. For you have armed me with strength for the battle. You have subdued under me those who rose against me. You have also given me the necks of my enemies, so that I destroyed those who hated me. They looked, but there was none to save. Even to the Lord, but he did not answer them. It's really interesting how when times are tough and times are hard, even the, like, the, the staunchest of atheists can 
all of a sudden find a little bit of faith in God during those hard times because when life hits you and hits you hard, you're going to look for anything and everything you can basically to save you. And God, he's known as a savior. He's known as someone who is willing to help. And I'm not saying that you can't at the last minute accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. That you're like the whole if this verse reminds me of what happens to people who live their entire lives generally without God. And I'm not saying that those people can't be saved. The thief on the cross is a perfect example of someone who accepted Christ literally at death's door, and Jesus welcomed him with open arms. The key to that is actually believing in God and in Jesus in your heart and actually being sorry for the things you've done. If you think you can just, you know, make some profession of faith with your mouth like, yes, Jesus, I believe in you. Please forgive me of my sins. I believe you died on the cross and rose again. Thank you, Lord, for salvation. Amen. And you just kind of say that as a fire insurance thing. Or you say it out of fear because life's gotten really hard on you and things have been really bad and you need something, anything. And no other human can judge your heart. You know, if you make a prayer and a profession of faith in Jesus Christ, I can't say you're not saved. I can't say that you're lying. Um, depending on the circumstances and if I know you well enough, I may say, dude, I don't think that was a legitimate prayer. And certainly that is the case with a lot of people. Anyone who goes to Christ be it at the end of their life or some point any time in their life, and they go to him saying, well, I'm going to say this prayer just in case this stuff is true. Just, you know, I'm going to cover my back, you know, I'm going to scratch his back and he'll scratch mine. Maybe I'll even go to church every now and then for those who aren't on death's door and put a little bit of money in there, just community service, you know, just make sure all my, make sure, you know, the entire range is covered so, like, no God is angry, and everyone likes me, and make sure that I have my get-out-of-hell-free card. And that does not work. If you're praying a prayer to Jesus, or if you're asking God to help you in a really tough time, and you've been fighting Him and the thing, and you've been sinning against Him for years, and all of a sudden you're like, whoa, things are really bad. Oh my God. Or, or oh my gosh, I'm, ab I'm about to die. I've got cancer. Yeah, I better become religious real quick. That's a reaction of fear and not of faith. Take this as a warning. If you say something to the Lord and you don't actually believe in Him, He's not going to listen to you. If you pray that prayer in faith, no matter how bad your sins are, if you've... this is, <laughs> I wonder if this will get stricken from monetization on YouTube. I'll find out. If you have, like, raped eaten and killed multiple people, a serial murderer, if someone as foul and disgusting as that, at some point, whether it's on death's door, at some point in their life, realize, whoa, I'm a terrible person. And for whatever reason, whatever has happened to that person's life, oh, and I, you know, I do believe in God, and he's real, and my gosh, I really need to be sorry for the things I've done. This is terrible. And that person turns to Jesus, they will be saved. Um, an interesting little story that you guys can look up, Ted Bundy, he professed Jesus Christ before he died. He had an interview with a man named James Dobson, very popular Christian counselor, radio personality. He should be very easy to find. In fact, on YouTube, I'm pretty sure the full interview is up. I forget the name of the video. Just type it in Google, or in, well, Google will work as well, or type it in YouTube like Ted Bundy interview with James Dobson. That should bring up many results immediately. And he did, he did exactly the things I just said. Um, well, maybe not the cannibalism part, but he did. He, he kidnapped, raped, and killed multiple women. I think the last one was like a little girl. So, scumbag person, douchebag, no two ways about it. I don't think anyone of any faith would really, well, maybe some really horrendous faiths, but basically no one would disagree with the saying that that guy was a horrible person. But if, his, if he really did believe in Jesus at the end, before he was about to die... If he really believed in God and believed that Jesus was capable of forgiving his sins, then he is in heaven. And he was forgiven of all those terrible things he did. But if you go to God and you just think you're going to get some insurance because, well, I better say something to him, I better shoot up a prayer, go to church, give some money just in case it's real, or you're on death's door, and, you're, and again, the thought is, you know, well, my gosh, 
God help me, you know, I'll, I'll do whatever you want, just please cure me, please help me. It doesn't work that way. You turn to the Lord, and He's not going to answer that faithless prayer, or that prayer of fear, or that prayer of desperation. God responds to faith. If you don't actually believe in Him, and you don't really think that Jesus died on the cross for you and rose again, if you don't actually believe in those things, He's not going to help you. Those are false professions of faith, whether it be at death's door, whether it be just during some terrible time in your life, if you don't really believe, God's not going to answer that prayer. And if you're his enemy, if you've been his enemy, expect to pay the consequences. Even if you do decide to fully accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, that doesn't mean some miracle is going to save you from death, going to get rid of that cancer, going to terminate the consequences of several disastrous, horrible choices. What that means is when you die, you'll go to heaven. And as you're going through a living nightmare on earth, your God, who has recently become your God, will be with you, and he will be with you through those hard times. Not that he'll get rid of the consequences. So you can't just go to God for fire insurance, so to speak. You can't just go to God as a just-in-case. That doesn't cut it with him. He's not going to answer you if you don't actually believe in him. Verse 43, Then I beat them as fine as the dust of the earth. I trod them like dirt in the streets, and I spread them out. Complete and total victory for those who believe in Christ Jesus. And even when t things look horrible in this life, like a lot of believers in the Bible, Old and New Testament, we find out they end up, get up giving up their lives for their faith. They went, through they went through some terrible times because of their faith and their relationship with God. But in the end, they're going to come out on top. Even if it's not always in this life, and that is where heaven kicks in, if you well, I would say whether you believe in him or not, Jesus is real. Whether you believe in heaven or he and hell or not, they're both real places. And if I'm right, then Jesus is real, even if I die the most miserable, painful, torturous death that history has ever seen or known. Of course, I hope that doesn't happen, but if it does, if I'm right about Jesus, I've got all of eternity to just have fun with him, to worship him, to praise him, to do whatever work it is people do in heaven, if there is any. As industrious as God is, I personally think there probably is something to do in heaven other than sit on a cloud and play a harp. And that's just, that's ridiculous. That is nowhere in scripture. I don't know where that idea of harps and clouds and stuff came from heaven. I have no idea where that originated from. That is not a biblical description of heaven. I know that much. So get that out of your head if you think of heaven. God will eventually beat down our enemies before us. There is victory in Jesus' name if we will fight for him and if we will believe in him. And if we will endure to the end, we will be saved. That's a promise from the word of God. And again, it comes down to faith. You do have to believe it. You can't do it half-heartedly. If you do believe it, God's going to cover you. If you don't actually believe it and you just shoot up a prayer as a just-in-case, God's not going to hear that. But for those who do believe... We can definitely defeat our enemies in this life. We can definitely win. Verse 44, You have also delivered me from the strivings of my people. You have kept me as the head of the nations. I'm sure he was referring specifically to um, when Saul betrayed him and when his own son, son Absalom betrayed him. And you have kept me as the head of the nations. A people I have not known shall serve me. The foreigners submit to me. As soon as they hear, they obey me. The foreigners fade away and come frightened from their hideouts. Total and complete victory. And there have been, and there, I'll say there are multiple stories in the Bible where someone, um, Simon Magus in the New Testament is one such person that comes to mind, where he was rebuked specifically by the Apostle Peter, and he had to submit to Peter. He couldn't get away from the power that Peter was demonstrating. He couldn't get away from the words that Peter was speaking. David, the one who sang this psalm, is a great example. He put down the Philistines all the days of his life, and he helped establish Israel and helped usher in the golden age that Solomon would eventually live out and reign during. David laid the foundation for all of that stuff. And there, are Joseph, back in Genesis, his brother sold him into slavery. And the nation he was a slave in, he ended up becoming the second most powerful person in that entire nation. He provided for his own family and his own people, as well as all of Egypt and several other lands, because the Lord promoted him, because he lived a life of faith. He lived a life in servitude and obedience to God. 
and he was well rewarded. So not so. Do we suffer for our faith in this life? Absolutely. Can we go through some really hard times in this life? Absolutely. Can good people suffer? Absolutely. But there are also many, many stories. Not just in the Bible. I also know of some person, just personally, people who serve the Lord and through some ridiculous circumstances and through some things that could be termed amazing circumstances, I would define them as miracles, they ended up coming out on top of their situation because they loved God, because they adhered to the end for His sake. And some great and wonderful things have happened in the lives of the people that I know. Not just in the Bible. I've seen this stuff work. And another application of this verse, the way, well, for example, I'm a Gentile. I'm a foreigner. I wasn't born Jewish. And here I am worshiping the Jewish God and his son, Jesus Christ. So I'm a foreigner that has come to him and proclaimed faith in him out of my mouth. Another victory for the kingdom right there. The fact that I was saved, the fact that I repented of my sins. I'm a foreigner that came, that, that came to him and submitted to him. And then verse 47, the Lord lives. Blessed be my rock. Let God be exalted, the rock of my salvation. That's pretty, it's a fairly popular song, or at least it was in the church at some point. Uh, that's great. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. Good times. It is God who avenges me and subdues the peoples under me. He delivers me from my enemies. You also lift me up above those who rise against me. You have delivered me from the violent man. Therefore, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the Gentiles, and sing praises to your name. Basically, a reiteration of everything that's been set up to this point. There is victory in the Lord. There is salvation in the Lord. Not only, is he our, he, not only is he our rock and our shelter and our salvation, he's also the one who subdues, subdues people before us. He teaches our hands to fight so we can fight his battles with him. It's not, and that's not, it, our battles are not a passive thing. We don't just sit back and say, Oh, yeah, God, you should take care of that problem over there. Thanks. Whew. Man, that's a good drink right there. So glad I've got God fighting my battles for me. No. We, as David went out to war himself, as the apostles had to actively proclaim the gospel in a very hostile environment, they were arrested and beaten multiple times for their faith in the Jewish nation, according to the book of Acts. And in the nations where they eventually went out as missionaries, as church history records, it's not just God doing all the work. David, yeah, the Lord delivered him out of the hands of his enemies. Doesn't mean David didn't take up um, his sling and five smooth stones when he stood before Goliath. Doesn't mean he didn't take up a sword and shield when he went out to fight against the Philistines throughout, throughout um, Saul's career and throughout his own career. We have our parts to play. We're told in Ephesians chapter 6, that we are to put on the full armor of God so that when the evil day comes, we may fight and stand. It's not just a God thing. We have our role to play in our day-to-day -day battles. And when it comes to personal temptation, I can't just sit back and say, Okay, God, could you help me out here? Having trouble? No. I've got to actively fight. I've got to actively resist those temptations. I've got to choose to follow the Lord. I've got to choose obedience. We have to actively participate in that battle. And when we do, we have victory in Him. Verse 51, he is the tower of salvation to his king and shows mercy to his anointed, to David and his descendants forevermore. And that right there is a reference to how eventually the Messiah of the Jewish people, Jesus Christ, would come through the lineage of David. So awesome. He sh and shows mercy to his anointed. God will show mercy to whom he will show mercy. That's a verse back in the... T um, uh, the word of faith, the word escapes me. I'm like, no, the Tanakh is the entire Old Testament, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament: Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. We see God's salvation over and over and over again. I was like, I don't want to, I don't want to close this up just yet. His, there's a reason he said that he shows mercy to whom he will show mercy. Because technically, and this pretty much flows right into the salvation message I give every Sunday. God doesn't have to show anyone mercy. We've all sinned against him. We all deserve judgment. We all deserve hell. 
But God, because he loves us, because he's merciful, he does call out to us in mercy saying, Come, come to me, repent of your wickedness, obey me, believe in me, I'll show you the right way, and I'll guarantee you your eternity and your future forever. He shows mercy to his anointed. He shows mercy to those whom he will. I'm not trying to um, tout a Calvinist line like there are some people that God won't call and you know just sucks to be them. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that if you're hearing this message and you've listened to this entire thing, and thank you, by the way, if you have done so. That is much appreciated. Thank you for giving me some of your time today. God gives everyone a chance to come to him. And today, if you've heard this message, this is your chance right now. This is your chance to receive his mercy. This is your chance to be his anointed. He's calling you right now. And we can't come to him or come to faith in him unless he calls us. Unless we hear the gospel, we can't come to faith in him. And God gives everyone a chance to say, you know what? There's something wrong with this world. And there's got to be more than this. And if, if you're at a point right now where you're like, you know what, Brandon? I think you're exactly right. I do believe in God, and I know I need forgiveness. I need, I need a change in my life. You don't just, you're, you're not just looking for some fire insurance. You're not just looking for a, a quick and easy way out. You realize you've messed up. You realize you've sinned against the Lord. You realize that you need his salvation. And if that's the case, just tell him that, that you believe in him, that you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and rose again three days later, and that you need his forgiveness. If you tell him that, he will answer that prayer. He will save you. And if you want like a model prayer to follow after, um, if you can't really quite find the words, follow this prayer after me, and believe it with all the faith in your heart. Pray, Lord Jesus, I believe that I'm a sinner. I believe that I need your help, your salvation. I believe you died on the cross for me. I believe you rose again three days later. And I believe that you're hearing this prayer right now and that you're real. And I'm asking you to save me right now. And by faith, thank you, Lord, that you have saved me and that you've heard this prayer and that now I'm one of your children. Thank you so much. Amen. And if you prayed that prayer, congratulations. You are now a part of the children of God. Welcome to the family. It is awesome, awesome to have you here. If I may encourage you, try to find a group of people that also believe in Jesus. You're generally going to find the church to be the best place to look for those people. Not all churches are good, but there are still some good ones out there. Find a group of people who believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again to forgive them of their sins. Find a group of people who believe that the Bible is the Word of God. They, I wish there were more of us. And I wish there were more churches in this, on, this, on this world and in this country. I wish there were more churches that were a bit more sold out and loving God, not just going through the routine and through the motions every single week. But don't give up the journey. Don't give up the faith. Keep searching. The Lord will find you a home. He will find you a place. And He will find you like-minded people your brothers and your sisters in Christ who also believe in him. He will find those people for you. And if you would take the time, and if you don't own one, the money to purchase a Bible and to spend a little bit of time in it every day, you don't have to like spend an entire hour in prayer. You don't even have to read an entire chapter every day. If you would just read a little bit every single day, that'll teach you the heart of God. That'll teach you how he does things. That'll teach you about who he is and the God you now serve. Take a little bit of time every day to read just a little bit of the Bible. You know, even if it's only a few verses, if you're incredibly busy or incredibly rushed, just a few verses can make all the difference to your day. All I can say there is, believe me, I've seen it happen. And I've also seen it happen with many other people in my life who also believe in the Lord and seek after him. One last exhortation, just one more. Find a little bit of Christian music to listen to. Nowadays, you can find it in any genre, under any application, and it's good. It un Some of it's still a little bit cheesy, I won't deny, but a vast majority of it nowadays, it's very solid musically, very solid vocally, very solid lyrically. Um, whatever your genre is, whatever you like, find some way to think on God. Find some way to sing a song to Him. We, we did over the course of four weeks, we covered one of David's songs to the Lord. And I'd encourage you to find some songs 
some contemporary songs to the Lord that you can just fall in love with, that you can just you know play every now and then, that you, that'll just bring your thoughts and your heart and point them towards your new Lord and Savior. Guys, thank you very much for watching this video. Appreciate it so much. I love you, and God bless.